Welcome to Kane and Company with your host, David Kane. Hello and welcome to Kane and Company here on the CBT Automotive Network. My name is David Kane. I'm the president of Kane Automotive, and I'm excited to announce that we are now streaming on Roku, Apple TV, and mobile devices. So uh, you can carry us around anytime and, and meet great people like uh, April Simmons, who is the marketing director of the Horn uh, Auto Group based in uh, the uh, central part of Arizona and uh, nice and warm here as we come to you uh, first of the year in 2024 in January in very, very cold Atlanta. I got off the airplane this morning, it was 30 degrees, so um, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, April, if you could tell us a little bit about your company and tell us for the fun of it how you got into the automotive business and, and what are some of your thoughts of the future? Awesome. Well, first of all, just thank you for having me, David, and, and CBT News. This is a great start to the year, and you're right. It is a little warmer here, but not in all parts of Arizona. So Horn Auto Group, um, we are based in the Phoenix Metro. However, we are sprinkled throughout all of Arizona. We have 14 stores. Um, some of them are up north in the mountains where it is very cold and they're getting oh, yeah. a good amount of snow as we speak. So we have a, a lot of diverse uh, landscape here. Our 14 stores, we have Hyundai, Kia, three Ford stores, we have three Stellantis stores, um, Chevy, GMC, Cadillac, two Nissan locations, wow. two Mazda locations. Um, so we cover the majority of the OEMs, which gives me a really good um, somewhat crystal ball to look at what's going on and how do we plan for the next year by looking at what has happened in the past. And we have to tweak each of these stores by OEM and location. I have two stores, for instance, that basically share a parking lot and their strategies are completely different because of their consumer base. So I think one thing we really can dial into now is making sure that our strategies align individually um, because we have great data nowadays. And that's not something we had 26 years ago when I first started in the car business. Oh so my gosh. Wow. I know, people are usually shocked when I tell them I've been doing this that long. Um, I actually started in the car business on the opposite side in Nebraska, which is where I'm from. Um, a lot of people don't know that. I grew up in Nebraska and I worked at a bank. And back then we bought all of the loans from the local car dealerships in Omaha, Nebraska. Oh, wow. And when we did that, that was back before we even faxed over applications. So the finance managers would bring the applications to the bank and we would all sit around and, and figure this out. I had to do dealer reserve by hand, you know, spreadsheets wow. and whatnot. There was no computer programs that, that did it for us back then. And I just realized something that I didn't know. The car business looked like something that I would really love and enjoy. So when I moved to Arizona, that's what I set my sights on. I wanted to get into the car business. And so I did, and I did all of the jobs. I worked in the office. I then um, worked ex back up in finance, you know, did a lot of their paperwork and that sort of thing. Um, then I started doing sales and then only did that a brief period of time. As interesting as it is, I actually did sales and worked in the office because I was very young, lived in Arizona by myself. I didn't have, you know, people to pay my bills and was nervous about, you know, 100% commission. So I did all of that um, and then finally moved into finance full time and did that for eight years, seven years as a retail desk manager, and then had a general manager one day say, April, I keep hiring internet people and they can't sell. You can sell, I need you to go learn the internet. <laughs> and I told him he was crazy at the time because I was the last person to get a smartphone. I was the last person to you know, go from tapes to CDs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I really saw the vision that that's where the market was going. And if I wanted to progress further, I needed to do that. Once I got into the internet department, I actually realized that marketing was something I needed to learn because if I was going to hold people accountable yeah. and um, I was going to be able to do better, you know, make better decisions for my group, I needed to learn that. So I kind of self-taught 
myself marketing. I don't have a marketing degree. It wasn't something I grew up with. I just saw the need and decided that was something I, I wanted to take on. So that's basically where I, where I am today is I went through 15 years with Toyota, um, spent some time with a Cadillac GM store for about five years and then started with Horn Auto Group in 2017. So I've been with the group now, um, what, six years. Wow, good for you. And something that uh, I find really interesting is you demand collaboration from your vendors. And you recently uh, struck a chord with the 20 group that you're a member of. And, and you mentioned the fact that when you redesigned the Horn Auto Group website, you really had to put some vendors to the curb because they refused to collaborate. Could you talk a little bit about what brought that on, what that process looked like, and now uh, are you benefiting from that decision that you made then? Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a certain aspect in, that we get to in our careers where we realize that we can do better. Yes. And too many times we get told, well, no, we don't do that. No, we can't do that. And as I started speaking with more and more people, going to conferences, getting to be a part of a 20 group with you, I really realized that that wasn't necessarily true. You know, the person on the other end of the phone and what they tell us isn't necessarily fact. And sometimes you have to demand to go higher and yeah. say, hey, I want to talk to your boss. Okay, I want to talk to your boss. All right, let's talk to your boss. And at some point, you'll realize that the people who create these companies or the vendors per se, they do want to make you happy. And yes. most of them, if they're able to, will collaborate. So the people who tell you no, what I have found is that usually it's because they don't know or they're lazy, AKA they don't care. So it's something I always say, you don't know or you don't care, it's one of the two. That's all there is to it. So when I went on a mission to make my group website better, I realized that one of the hard aspects of working on a group site is that I'm dealing with a lot of different vendor partners coming into that space, right? So OEMs require me to use different websites, right? So I, some, some stores are on this program, some are on that sure. program. And now as a group, I'm trying to bring all of that together. So I needed people that would be willing to work together to maximize my opportunities within my group site. Then once I got that first foundation layered, my next real attack for vendor partnership was, okay, I don't want nine different pop-ups yeah. on my site, right? What I want is whoever is going to convert the best because that's the whole goal of a group site, actually of any website. The number one goal of your website is to take all the traffic that you paid to get there and convert it, okay? Whether we're talking about sales or we're talking about fixed apps, no matter what traffic you're driving to your website, the goal is to convert it. So the group site is no different. I want to convert all the traffic that's coming there. How can I go about doing that? So I spoke with my chat providers, my digital retailing providers, my call tracking providers. I had to get them all on a call together and wow. say, okay, here's my vision. Here's yeah. how I want this to work. Now let's make it happen. Um, and that took the better part of about three, four months to work through all of those tweaks um, because not only do you have to do it on desktop, but you want to make sure that you're able yeah. to utilize those tools properly on your mobile device as well, um, and then be able to track it all. Because nothing, for me, it doesn't, if it if I can't track it, it didn't happen Yeah. when it comes to digital marketing. So I want to know exactly how many calls I got and then who was rewarded with that phone call. What store did it go to? If they clicked on this, who did they, who did they convert on site? Did they go to their website? And then did they do something on that, the child site, so to speak, yeah. and really be able to get a visual on what type of marketing tactics make sense for the group, because that is completely a different strategy than an individual site. No question. You know, it's so interesting because uh, 
we've operated Kane Automotive for 20 years, and my wife and I, it's a small operation, but uh, whenever she would go to do an invoice to a dealer client, one of the first things she would do is go to the website, she'd see a name of someone she was to send the invoice to, and she'd try to get to know the personality of the dealership, and it was uncanny how she would you know, draw me in and say, I really like this, I like the story that they're telling. And I don't think a lot of people uh, now put the effort into websites because we've kind of made it all about the data. So, so obviously you've done the balance. You know, you gotta have the look, the feel, the user experience, but you gotta have the data to support that. Yeah, if we put something to the right and, and something on the mobile, uh, you know, we've gotta make sure it works really well for the customer. And, you know, it is interesting, and, and I'm curious what your thoughts are as we switch gears here just a little bit. Women in the automotive industry, I travel about and I go to showrooms and go into crowded training rooms and one woman, uh, no women. Uh, it's really, really frustrating. And then you go back to fix stops and there's a whole host of women that are greeting guests when they come in and uh, go to a business development center, all of the usual roles in the dealership. Why isn't uh, variable ops or sales ops uh, for most of us, why is it embracing more females? Is there something to do with that? I worked in the office because I was afraid of full commission. What, what have we got to do better to draw more women into the sales workplace? Well, I think it really boils down to two things. Um, and these are two things that I've personally experienced, so I, so I can really talk to them. Um, number one, ego. Males have to get over the fact that women are basically better salespeople in nature. By yeah. nature, women are more empathetic and therefore better salespeople. I have seen more women get pushed out of the variable side because the men's ego gets so frustrated with the fact that they're beating them yeah. that they do everything they can to push them out. Yeah. Um, so embracing embracing the, the women to come into the space and actually making them feel like they belong and helping them versus kicking them um, and trying to get them to go because you don't like that they're actually beating you. So, yeah. <laughs> and, and this is that's probably the most honest I've ever been. Um, just you know, on, on a recorded session on on how that really goes. The other side to it is really the the, the flexibility in in the schedule. So when my son was growing up, his dad was a stay at home dad, which allowed me to be able to work inside the variable space and the variable yeah. opportunities. But for a lot of women who are mothers, that is not necessarily an easy task to say, I have a schedule that is just basically TBD. Yeah. Any day, I don't know what time I'm gonna show up, what time I'm gonna leave. I don't know if I'm working all weekend, if I'm working all nights. I don't know what my schedule is next week, next month, next year. And those uncertainties can cause a lot of stress um, for people who are trying to be in that space. So yeah. if we really want to bring more women in, I think we have to, I tell my general managers this all the time. We grew up in a, in a time in the automotive space where it was tough. It was yeah. tough. Like you, you got your teeth kicked in on a daily basis. It was tough. And once we get to a leadership role, we have this idea of like, now I'm the one, I'm the king machismo and I get to do these things. And I said, you know, Remember how, how you felt when you were getting your teeth kicked in? I tell people, treat people the way you wish you were treated, not yes. necessarily the way that you were. Yeah. And that's how we can start to really move the dynamics in our industry to attract not only better employees, but better retention for customers as well. Oh, boy. Powerful. Uh, thoughts here to start the 2024 year. Uh, thank you so much for spending time with us, April. And uh, to our audience, thanks for joining us. And we hope to see you next time here on Kane & Company on the CBT Automotive Network. And once again, I want to point out you can watch us on Roku, Apple TV, or mobile devices. Thank you so much, April, and we'll see you real soon.
Thanks for watching Kane and Company with David Kane.